We said and emphasized that the deed that is best is the deed that is most desirable by Allah at the particular time and situation. There are certain deeds that are inherently virtuous over other deeds. Certain deeds that are inherently virtuous. And the companions would not make this question unless they have known that there are deeds that are better than others. And the companions often ask the Prophet about the best of deeds. Yeah, because they were keen to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here are some of the Prophet's answers. Muhammad ibn Jabal asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so Tabarani and Ibn Hibban reported from Muhammad ibn Jabal, he said, I asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which of the deeds is more beloved to Allah. He said, to die while your tongue is wet with the remembrance of Allah, or moist from the remembrance of Allah. So can you imagine this? Like you are in this, what does this mean? It means that you are in constant remembrance. Because when does, the, when does death come? Immediately, suddenly. You don't know when death comes. So this means that you are in constant remembrance of Allah, that when death comes, you will, you, your tongue will be moist with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the remembrance of Allah is not only a verbal phenomenon. The, the remembrance of Allah is a, a heartly action, firstly and foremostly, and then it is accompanied by the remembrance of the tongue, but the tongue is reminding the heart to stay in remembrance. The tongue basically is reminding the heart to stay in remembrance and manifesting this remembrance. It's a mutual feedback between the tongue and the heart, a mutual relationship between the tongue and the heart. Uh, and if the heart is in remembrance, the tongue will manifest it. It will come on the tongue. Uh, with, without effort. And if the tongue is in remembrance, the heart gets reminded of whatever the tongue says if one is, is paying attention and is contemplative. But certainly, the shaitan can make this very habit of remembrance also void of its meaning, function, benefit by becoming a second habit without contemplation. You know, so Tark tafakkur, you know, abandonment of tafakkur, contemplation, is the killer of any action. When you're praying without contemplation of the benefits of the prayer, what you're about when you start the prayer, that the prayer is a conversation with Allah, it's supplication, it's munajah, which is soft conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you, when you re forget all of this, then the prayer will be void of the, the best of what it is about and uh, will, uh, will not produce the, the benefit that is expected. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, whenever Abdullah is mentioned without mentioning who, uh, which Abdullah, then they're talking about ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ayyul a'mari yahabbu ila Allah, qala salatu ala waqtiha. By the way, why is this? Why is Abdullah means Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? Because in, 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 uh, in our culture, whenever there is, you know, like a lot of people competing, but then you give precedence to the oldest. And Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As and Abdullah ibn Zubay are all juniors to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And those who are, would be the ones that, you know, would come to mind when you talk about Abdullah. The Abadila are four. The ones that are called Abdullah are four. These are Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdullah ibn uh, no, Amr ibn Al-As. Amr ibn Al-As. Okay, so 
And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is not considered one of them because he was not as young as they are. So he takes a special status. He was, the, he was certainly older than all of the four. And whenever Abdullah is mentioned, then it is uh, without mentioning uh, son of whom, then it is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Radiallahu anhu. And the, most, the two that are most junior out of them are, are who? Ibn Umar and no, no, Ibn, Umar, Ibn Abbas and Ibn Zubayr. And the most junior of all of them is Ibn Zubayr. So Mas'ud, Ibn Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ayyul a'mari habu ilallah, qala salatu ala waqtiha, qultu thumma ayy, qala thumma birru al-walidayn, qultu thumma ayy, qala thumma jihad fi sabi lillah, qala haddathani bihinna wa la ustazattuhu nazadani. I asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which of the deeds are more beloved to Allah? He said, pray it on time. Then I asked him, and, and then which? Uh, or which is next, he said, kindness to the parents, and then I asked him, and which is next, and then he said, of jihad fi sabir Allah, or in the cause of Allah, and if I asked him for more, he would have given me more. So, do you, do you notice that this is different from the answer that he gave to, to Mu'adh ibn Jabbar? <clears throat> and this is, a, this is another different answer. This is about a man from Khasan. So this man from uh, the tribe of Khathan came and asked the Prophet وسلم, while he was in the midst of his Ashab companions. He said, فَقُلْتُ أَنْتَ الَّذِي تَزْعُمُ أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ You are the one, I came to the Prophet وسلم, and he was amongst his companions and I said to him, you are the one who claims to be the messenger of God. Uh, he said yes, simply yes. قال قلت يا رسول الله أي الأعمال أحب إلى الله قال الإيمان بالله. He said, O Messenger of Allah, which of the deeds is most beloved to Allah? And the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said, الإيمان بالله, belief in Allah or faith in Allah. Then he he asked him. ثم ما قال ثم صلاة الرحم. And then which one is next? And then he said kindness to the king. And then he asked him, which one is next? And then he said, to the ordain good and forbid bad. And uh, then he said, which of the deeds are most to be hated to Allah? But he said, ishraku billah, ascribe partners to Allah. And then he said, which is next? And then he said, to uh, shun your kin. And then he said, which is next? He said, to ordain bad and forbid good. So basically the opposites of what he said uh, first about the deeds most beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will find that these the answers are different from the previous ones. But if someone comes to the Prophet وسلم, and asks him and says to him, you're the one who claims to be the messenger of God. Should you jump over faith and go right into prayer here? Because this is a man who is shake, shaking faith. This is a man who is saying to the Messenger of Allah, you are the one who claims to be the Messenger of God. So certainly the, what this man needs the most is faith. Because that, that's the priority for this particular man. So it would have been inappropriate for this man to tell him a, a prayer. In a, or to, to, to tell him to, to die while your tongue is moist with the remembrance of Allah. And then because this man was rough, the Prophet ﷺ made sure to tell him that the second best is kindness to the king. Because he, he felt that he was rough. He's coming to the Messenger of Allah in the midst of his companions. And he has this rough attitude, and he says to him, you are the one who claims to be the messenger of God. So for this man, he needs to you know, soften his heart before you know, anything else. And then the Prophet ﷺ felt that this man, because usually, usually <coughs> bad and good qualities are mixed in a certain way that there is usually a good balance. So <coughs> roughness 
and bravery can sometimes be mixed. So people who are rough, they could be more, oh, they, like, they could be braver, they could be more capable of ordaining good and forbidding bad, because this is just their nature. So the Prophet ﷺ told them first that you need to soften a little bit, <coughs> but use that quality in you, you know, because it's brave also to come while the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in the midst of his companions, and to tell him, you are the one who claims to be the messenger of God. It indicates, like, some, certainly in that particular context, it's audacity. It is not praiseworthy bravery, <coughs> but it indicates that he does have this in him, that he has this sort of uh, quality in him. So the prophet pointed out to him how to use it right. After you soften your heart, and you become more moderate and softer, and know how to join the kin, then uh, you could ordain good and forbid bad, use that quality in you, you know, and, and go and ordain good and forbid bad. So this was the, the right prescription for this one. And then, this is the hadith that I mentioned earlier from Tabarani, reported from Abdullah ibn Umar about the Ahabu nas ila Allah, wa Ahabu al-Amari ila Allah, where the Prophet ﷺ said the most beloved of people to Allah is the one who brings the most benefit to people. And the most beloved of deeds to Allah is making a Muslim happy, relieving him of hardship, paying off his debt, or warding off hunger from him, going with my Muslim brother. To, and then the Prophet ﷺ said, and going with my Muslim brother to meet his need uh, is dearer to me than observing God to in this mosque for a month. And he who suppresses his aggravation while being capable of retaliation, Allah will fill his heart with pleasure or with hope. Or in, in some other reports, it's raja, not rida. So uh, pleasure or hope. On the day of resurrection, and whoever goes with his Muslim brother to meet his need, Allah will make him stand firm on the day uh, when all feet will slip. One feet will slip or be shaky. In other words, this is the hadith that is used by the people who say that the deeds that are of benefit that goes beyond the doer are the most the most beloved of deeds. But this is not the single answer the Prophet ﷺ gave to this question, recurrent, repeated question by, by the companions, which tells you what tells you that even though some deeds are more virtuous than others, and the Prophet sort of mentioned some of them, yet the Prophet sort of was not given like a, one prescription for all. Everybody has their own prescription, depending on their qualities, uh, their characteristics, the needs of the time as well. So it's about the person and about the time uh, and the circumstance. I will take your questions now about the, the previous segment. And inshallah, we'll start when we come back with the types of the hearts. Because Zuhd is not to disown the dunya. Zuhd is to, dis, to, to, to have this interest in the dunya. It is not necessarily to disown it. It is not necessarily to uh, not possess it. It is to not let it possess you. 
it, it, so that's why the scholars used to say, keep it in your hand away from your heart. As long as you keep the dunya in your hand away from your heart, you're fine. But then, that is also not very easy. Keep in, keep in mind that there is nothing that is easy. It, it all goes back to your dedication, to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you have been given the guidance, you will get the right answer. Your heart will get the right answer concerning every question. The end of Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا And those who strive in our cause, we shall guide them to our paths in plural. And I always, you know, for, 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 for some long time I wondered, why did Allah say subulana and not sabilana? Because the path of Allah is one, and there are other paths that are all paths, paths to deviation. But why did Allah say in this ayah, subulana and not sabilana? Our paths versus our path in singular form. Do you, do you know why? Because from your perspective, from Allah's perspective, there is one path to Allah. But given the variability of the, and the, the, of the questions and circumstances that you come across, that you encounter, many, many things that you encounter, many questions that come up, many situations where you need an answer. So from your end, from your perspective, there are multitudes of paths, because there are multitudes of situations, circumstances, questions that need answer, and so on. So for regarding everything, you need, you need to guidance regarding your relationship with your wife, your relationship with your husband, or uh, your career, you know, moving or immigrating here, immigrating there, regarding the balance between you know, the dunya and the fira, and how much you go about owning the dunya for the benefit of the Muslimin, for the benefit of yourself and your family, and, and when, is that, when is that crossing the threshold? And you know, when have you uh, crossed into greed? Because there is a very fine line between owning the dunya to support yourself, support your family, and to excel and to show people that Muslims are, are, do, do best at their jobs and to uh, even own it for the best uh, interest of the Muslims and give money like Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and Uthman ibn Affan who used to be very rich and used to support the cause of Islam in multitudes of ways to the point where Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, the Prophet وسلم, said about him when he uh, the, uh, you know, supported the mission of Jaysh al-Usra, or the battle of hardship, uh, nothing would hurt Uthman ibn Affan after what he had done today. So you say to yourself, what, I, you know, I want to be like Uthman ibn Affan. I want to be like Uthman ibn Affan and be able to do this for the Muslims. Is that a bad intention? No, it's not a bad intention. But then that requires a lot of work also. It requires you, know, you to be like, like a Bill Gates or some, something close to that, uh, to be able to support like an army, you know, the mission of an army. Uh, so where do you draw the line? you will never get an answer from a sheikh about where to draw the line. That is truly when you need the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide your heart so that all of your work and all of your excellence and work is for him, not for anyone else. So basically, be concerned with one thing, which is the pleasure of Allah, and then you will get guidance concerning all things, all matters, all questions, all pursuits. But that is the, 
that is the ongoing struggle. That's why Allah called it al jihadu fina. It's jihad. It is hard. It's a striving, struggle throughout your life. To, to, but to, so that your main concern is the pleasure of Allah. And then you will not need to worry about so many things because your heart will become guided. Your heart will get guidance concerning all of those difficult questions to answer. And they are certainly difficult questions to answer. And there is no one that can draw the line for you. There is no one that can draw the line for you where you should stop. So that is the answer to that. Did you explain the verse in a paradise as white as the heavens and the earth? What does it mean by as white as the heavens and the earth? It means as white as the heavens and the earth. <laughs> Uh, but keep in mind, like one thing, that there there are says, you know, <clears throat> when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes paradise, you have to always remember that place of jannah in dunya illa asma, that there is nothing uh, in, in, in there is no similarity between jannah that which is in jannah and that which is in dunya except the names. Meaning that those names make things uh, perceivable by you as a human being. But it is a completely different world, completely different existence. So don't think that whatever is in the Jannah is like whatever is in the Dunya. Those descriptions are for you as a human being. There is some degree of overlap. Otherwise, Allah SWT would not give us those things. So there is grapes and dates in Jannah. There is some degree of overlap between the grapes and dates of Jannah and the grapes and dates in Dunya. Otherwise, the mention of grapes and dates in Jannah would be of no uh, truth. But there is. However, they are completely unlike the grapes and dates in Dunya. And this description is basically to give you an idea. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot you know, because the grapes and dates in Jannah are completely different from the grapes and dates in Dunya. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them something else other than the grapes and dates, how would you relate to that? You cannot relate to that. So Allah gives you those as examples of what you may experience in Jannah, not that there is anything in Jannah that is like anything in the Dunya, or not that there is anything in this Dunya like whatever will be there in Jannah. The, what Allah prepared for us in Jannah is unlike anything the eyes had seen uh, or anything the ears had heard or anything that have come across the hearts of people or the minds of people. Unlike anything. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to tell you of the vastness of this Jannah. So Allah tells you that the width of the Jannah is like the heavens and the earth. As much as you could comprehend as a human being, as much as you could encompass as a human being, because there is nothing beyond the heavens and the earth for you as a human being. that in the section praise unto Allah to take advantage of your ability and to excel in worship while healthy and that you will indefinitely be rewarded when you no longer uh, have this ability as indicated by the hadith of the Prophet if the slave of Allah becomes ill or travels. 
is it required if one prefers an act or performs an act or acts of worship, he or she must continue to perform them and maintain them. Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why is it that Abdullah ibn Amr wished that he had taken the permit from the Prophet sallallahu about his fasting, praying, qiyam, when he grew older? That is actually consistent with what we said. The Prophet sallallahu told them to do what you can manage with uh, consistency throughout your life. So cut down on your salah and siyam and qiyam so that you could be consistent in this throughout your life. And then when Abdullah ibn Umar grew older and these became harder on him, he wished that he accepted the, the advice of the Prophet ﷺ when he was older. But then the idea here is, why did he wish to do that? He could have done this when he was older. He could have quit when he was older. Uh, because that, that would be like a setback. You know, you do things that you can do consistent, consistently so that you do not go through such setbacks. You, you have a certain uh, routine with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a certain word, awrad, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Word is your routine function. Word is your routine wazifa or your routine function with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a certain word of dhikr, certain word of salat, certain word of siyah, certain routine functions that you consistently do. And then you cut back on them. That's a sit back. That, that, that is basically walking away or partially walking away, or turning your back to Allah, or partially turning your back to Allah. So you should not do the things that you cannot consistently do. But sometimes, if you, like if you do the things that you could consistently do, and then you encounter an extraordinary circumstance, such as travel or sickness, and you couldn't do them, then your reward will continue for those acts that you have been doing in your uh, at home in the state of health. So basically, do the things that you could do in your ordinary conditions, that you could do con consistently. And if you come across extraordinary conditions, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, be most generous and he will continue the reward for you. Can you please give the reference, last source, of the parable of the king's ship again, spelling of the scholar's name? Ibn Qudam. Yes. Uh, in the hadith about the one who brings the most benefit to people, after that statement, it gives example of a lot of helping out a lot of Muslims. It actually mentions the Muslims. Indeed, are there any narrations or have the scholars discussed the reward of benefiting Muslims versus non-Muslims in terms of relieving their stress, feeling the hungry, visiting the sick, helping them with money, etc., social welfare? Yeah. <coughs> 
So basically, acts of kindness and charity uh, for Muslims and non-Muslims alike are virtuous. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna fi kulli dhatika bidin ratba sadaqa." There is charity in every kindness you do towards anything with a moist liver, any living creature. There is charity in any kindness you uh, do for any living creature. Anything with a moist liver, meaning any living creature. Now, can we say that this hadith would apply to non-Muslims? Uh, not exactly. The hadith that talk about basic acts of justice and kindness and good manners would apply to Muslims and non-Muslims, even if Muslims were mentioned. Such as, لا تحسد ولا تنجش ولا تبغض ولا تدبر ولا يضع بعضكم على بيع أخيه And do not outbid your brother. Does it mean that as a Muslim you outbid non-Muslims? No, the scholars said that this, the mention of your brother here is not to exclude non-Muslims from those etiquettes or not, for, from exhibiting those, those etiquettes towards them, that you do not outbid non-Muslims or you do not know, do a nudge, well, which is you know, to, to hire the price for them without interest in, in purchase or you, you don't do those acts. Uh, the mention of Akhi, the, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the word Akhi here to highlight the evil of such acts, but not to mean that it would be permissible for someone who is not Muslim. Because those basic you know, tenets of conduct, you should adhere with them with your in your treatment to Muslims and non-Muslims. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because there, there are those statements in the Old Testament about you know being able to take usury from someone who is not Jewish, for instance, versus someone who is Jewish. And those statements, we believe, have not been conveyed by uh, Prophet Musa salam because they, they, they compromise that sense of justice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَرُوا لَيْسَ عَلَيْنَا فِي الْأُمِّيْنَا سَبِيرُ وَيَقُرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ هُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ They said that we have no, there is no uh, liability on us for what we commit against the Ummiyyin, the Gentiles. And they, they, they speak falsehood against Allah. بَعْلَى مَنْ أَوْفَى بِعَهْدِهِ وَالتَّقَى فَإِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَّقِينَ Nay, whoever fulfills his covenant and fears Allah concerning their transactions with, uh, with anyone, regardless of who they are, Allah loves those that are pious. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned this from Bani Israel, condemned this attitude from Bani Israel, then certainly it is a condemnable attitude. And in, when, when it comes to justice and kindness with the people, you treat the people the same way. But could, is there a higher virtue for this when you do it to your Muslim brother? He's more entitled to your kindness. Therefore, there is higher reward. There is higher reward if you're, so Islam, there, there are rights for the bond of Islam, the wala, or the allegiance to Islam and the Muslims, uh, comes with rights for each and every Muslim. There are rights for the neighbor the rights for the king, right? So if you have a, a Muslim neighbor who's your relative, no one has more rights than that one, right? But, right? A Muslim neighbor who is your relative has more rights than anyone else. Because there are rights for Islam, there are rights for neighborhood, there are rights for kinship, and this person has, it, has uh, all of them. The, the neighbor who is Muslim but not of your kin, has less rights than the first one. Does that mean that you'll do harm to them? Absolutely. They have a lot of rights. The neighbor who's not Muslim and not your, your relative, does he have rights? He has rights. Should you be just with them? You should be. Should you extend kindness to them? You should do that. But kindness that is extended to your Muslim neighbor who is your relative is more reward worthy than kindness that is extended to your Muslim neighbor 
who is not your literary relative, or to your Muslim relative who is not your neighbor. Because that's a combination of uh, rights. And when you have them all, then, the, then you get the greatest reward. So there, there is a higher reward for extending those acts of kindness to your Muslim uh, brother. But that does not mean that there is no reward or there is no great reward in extending these acts of kindness to, to everybody. Which means like if you, if you have a relief organization, you should prioritize the needs of your Muslim brethren, but at the same time, you should extend your scope of work to all people. And if there is like an emergency, such as in Philippines, for instance, you should direct your resources to that emergency because it's so pressing, even though they are not Muslim. But generally speaking, you have in the back of your mind that the Muslims have more rights on you. And I think we have we started to do this, alhamdulillah, right? Like you get a lot of solicitation from Islamic Relief and Ekmer Relief and so on for the disaster in the Philippines. The same happened in Haiti also when it was hit hard. So we're, we're doing it, alhamdulillah. Sisters, you don't have any other questions? One question. How do you strike a balance between doing that good work and also fearing of falling into the gap and the shaitan pushing that part to get out of doing things to show off and things in the future? Okay. The idea is you never quit doing your good work out of fear of Riyadh. Because that is a basically like a win-win situation for the shaitan. You know, uh, uh, what, what you need to do is you continue the good work and you continue to purify your intention. You continue the good work and you continue to purify your intention. There will always be ways for you to purify this intention while you're continuing your good work, if it is good. If it is good. Now, if you completely defeated, like it is all not for a lot, the, the thing itself was instigated and maintained uh, for other than Allah's cause or other than Allah's pleasure, then that is when you stop. It's totally, entirely, you know, and it is just not possible for you to, to clear your intention concerning this particular matter, this particular effort, then you just stop it. No. Striking a balance between uh, weaning yourself of the dunya, of interest in the dunya, and between uh, not preferring hardship. Well, when you wean yourself off the interest of the when you wean yourself off the interest of the dunya, does not mean that you will give up the dunya. Does not mean that you will, because the Prophet ﷺ forbade Saad and Abi Waqqas from uh, giving up his wealth. And he said to him, And he said to him, He forbid him from giving up his wealth. He forbid him from you know, giving up in wealth more than one third of his wealth. And he told them to give, to, to leave you know, two thirds or more for his family members. And because he said, and one third, to give one third out in charity is much. The Sahaba used to give one fifth of their, you know, wealth in charity. The, uh, so, so, so basically, that uh, giving up the uh, interest in the dunya is not by uh, sort of depossessing the dunya. That's a word. It, it is by Favoring, you know, al akhirah Favoring al akhirah is is basically twofold. One, how are you acquiring the dunya? 
if your acquisition of the dunya is coming at the expense of the akhirah, basically the acquisition of the dunya and the pleasures and enjoyments and of this dunya is happening at the expense of an akhirah. So you're, you, you're compromising the bounds of Allah, to ta'adda hudud Allah for the, for the dunya. Uh, you, you're not, you're abandoned wara, entirely abandoned, you know, cautious piety or wara, leaving a margin of safety between you and haram. Uh, or when you're compromising your obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the acquisition of the dunya. For everybody, like in Egypt, they always tell you, you know? <laughs> so work is a form of worship. Uh, so why don't you pray, you know? Let's take a little time off to pray. It's just five minutes. And then to the Amr <laughs> Ibad. Work is a form of worship. Well, this amal is actually ma'asiyah, uh, it's not ibadah. You know, there is no goodness or blessing in work that will distract you away from prayer. So, uh, so now, all of this is about the acquisition, acquisition of the dunya. Uh, you don't compromise, you maintain wara. You don't get distracted by from your, your obligations and from your equilibrium. Equilibrium. There is there is a point of equilibrium for, for each one of us, and it's different between you and someone uh, someone who is like uh, a known like an excellent surgeon, for instance. And the best thing he does is to do surgery for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he does a lot of this for charitable purposes. And he's very skilled and so on and so forth. When we say to this person that you should be, uh, certainly there is, there is knowledge that you need. To, to, and this knowledge is not limited to the obligatory knowledge. There is knowledge for your spiritual growth to be able to carry on this journey. And this surgeon would need to acquire this knowledge. But we, when we tell him, you know, to run around and attend all the seminars and lectures in town, uh, is that his, his, his point of equilibrium? It is not. This may be prescribed for someone who is there who uh, does a certain job, he does it well, he, he, is, he works in some field, and he does his job, he can maintain his family, but he spends more time on dawah, reaching out to people, and so on and so forth. So everybody will have to find his point of equilibrium, where the entirety of his life is for Allah, but the division of this, the breakdown of this, varies depending on your skills, your, your talents, whatever gifts Allah have given you. So someone who is gifted in doing surgery is different from someone who is gifted in talking to the people. And the division, the breakdown of their time will vary based on that. If you are in IT and you're gifted at you know, making websites, Islamic websites, I knew someone in IT when I was in Minnesota. He, he was producing Islamic websites for free for all organizations, left and right. Uh, and he was very skilled at this. So the breakdown of his time may be different, and he was not particularly, you know, uh, he was not the most scholarly, even though he was keen on learning. But he, you know, he was not taking this path like with full time dedication. And, but the breakdown, the point of equilibrium for this is different from the point of equilibrium for the surgeon. It's point for the, the point of equilibrium for someone who's a CEO of a company. And he is a very charitable person, a very charitable Muslim person, a CEO of a company, and he excels and he becomes like, you know, Bill Gates or, or something in, in, you know, in, in terms of wealth and so on. So everybody has this point of equilibrium. 
It is important that you don't disturb the point of equilibrium. It is important that you maintain at some degree of what are cautious piety in your transactions. It is important that you stay away completely from haram. It is important that you uh, live up to your obligations. You know, the fara'id of Allah Azza should never be compromised. And that's as far as acquisition. But then you, you acquire the dunya. How to keep it now in your hand and away from your heart, that is, that is how you spend it. How you spend it. That's how you dispense you know, from those acquisitions. And that is basically all of what we say was summarized by the Prophet in just two words. When he said to Amr ibn al-As, Na'imma al salih al-rajul salih How excellent is good money for a good man. So it said that mad is salih, good money, acquired, that, that's the acquisition part. The rajul is salih for the good person because he will know how to dispense it. So all of this is summarized in this hadith. Na'imma al-mal salih al-rajul is salih Good money is good for a good man. But if it is not good money, it is not good. And if it is good money, but it is not in the hands of a good man, it is not good. Good money is good for a good man. The acquisition and the dispensing. And then when you, when you acquire it, and you hold it in your hand, the, the sci there are so many signs that, is, that it has not captured your heart. And people can, can figure this out. People are able to know this that it has not possessed you. You possess it. It doesn't possess you. It is in your hand. It is not in your heart. You're in control of your money. Your money is not in control of you. Uh, and and, and people, all people know the, the, the many signs of, of, of this, including certainly how charitable they are and how much they give of this money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Um, on the topic of uh, Ariyat, when performing deeds uh, in public in particular, um, we know that actions are by intention, but uh, is it possible, um, in a sense, for your purification of your deeds to apply retroactively? For example, if you give uh, in front of somebody and you know that despite your best efforts, there's still some form of Ariyat that you're struggling with, and you walk away from that that deed dissatisfied because you know it wasn't 100% pure, can you still, after the deed is done, continue to, in a sense, purify it? Does that make sense? Yeah. You continue to purify it by at least stopping the damage. It's, it's, a, it's the stage of damage control here. And the damage control is by quitting to uh, show off, uh, quitting to, you know, consider the favor on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his creation. Uh, you quit the mention of this. You don't mention it anymore. Because some people continue to mention, you know, I have given this much money and, and so on. You stop mentioning it, you, uh, you, and, and then certainly you don't remind the recipient of the charity, because that would be manna that would completely destroy the reward of the charity. Manna is when you remind the recipient of your charity. Uh, so that this is the stage of damage control. And then you, you, you purify your heart from the, the seeking God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for future uh, acts. Yes. I have two questions that relate to each other. Um, in terms of aligning, but, last, okay. In terms of aligning actions to be strictly for the sake of Allah, does one need to establish this intention before every act of being, for example, for being kind or being to parents, to be is to expect a reward for this action? And um, is there a way to differentiate differentiate between riyat and an unaddressed um, shaitan for both thinking? Is this uh, thought in itself a possible sign of interference from Shaitan with one's intention? Okay. <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'll ask the first, uh, answer the first one, and I'll defer the answer to the second one until you know another session, another QA session. Uh, but but the, the the first issue is 
when, when, when goodness becomes a second nature, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprives you of reward because you're just so used to doing good things, like when you don't think about kindness, like if you, if you, uh, you see someone walking in, like an, uh, an you know, elderly person walking in, and you stand up for them to greet them and to allow them to sit in your place without, without thinking, that do you, do you lose the reward for this action because you have not intended it at the time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is just part of your second nature. No, you do not. As long as it became part of your second nature for the sake of Allah, and as long as your devotion to Allah continues to be the, 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 the main uh, engine behind all of these, the, the main driving force. The main driving force is your pursuit of the pleasure of Allah. So individual acts of this nature will still be reward worthy even if you did not intend them at the time for the sake of Allah because they became a habit for you. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al khayr wa ada wa sharr wa jaja. Al khayr ada, al khayr becomes a habit for people because it is, it is in harmony with uh, our fitra, our inclination. Wa sharr wa jaja, and evil. Ya Shaykh Muhammad, how do you translate this? Al khayr wa ada. والشر اللجاجة الشر uh, yeah it's, it's very hard لجاجة is the, the thing that, that, that uh, vibrates the, about which you have so much reluctance there is resistance it, it does this the, there is no comfort with it there is discomfort reluctance about evil so al khair becomes a habit, becomes a habit for the for for the servants of Allah, because keep in mind that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created this. Allah is the creator of this universe. This universe will not find that each and every atom in this universe does not find its point of equilibrium, balance, balance, except in the service of Allah, except, except in the pleasure of Allah. Because that is when you have harmony between al-qaba' al-shara'i wa al-qaba' al-kawni, between the, the, the universal decrees of Allah and the religious decrees of Allah, his wants, his likes. Once you are in conformity with both, you will not have this conflict, inner conflict, inner conflict. Anyone who deviates, and all of the universe around us is in harmony with with the universal decrees of Allah, because they have given up, you know, the, the, the choice. They did not claim the choice. They gave up the choice. They wanted to be controlled by Allah all the time, universe, by the universal decrees of Allah. So the sun does not have a choice. The rivers, the wind, the, everything around us is in, in complete conformity with the will of Allah because they only have one decree that controls them. Which one? The universal decrees. You have two different forms of decrees because you accepted the choice, uh, the choice between right and wrong. So you have two different forms of decrees. The universal decrees that control you, life, death, sickness, health, to the some extent wealth, poverty, many, you know, your race, you did not choose it. Your nationality, you did not choose it. Your family, you did not. So many universal decrees control you. But then you have the religious decrees of Allah, the wants of Allah. You could say yes or no. We have shown him the two paths. So he can go here or there. If you, if you choose the path that is desired by Allah, then you brought the two dec decrees in harmony. And that is when you will have no inner conflict. And that is why al-khayr a'adah. Because the khayr is in accordance and conformity with, with the, will, the, the divine will, 
for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so there should be no resistance in your heart for al khayr There should be complete harmony, no reluctance. Sharr is lajaja. Sharr is, uh, uh, lajaja would be conflict, resistance, uh, huh? discomfort, huh? hesitation, hesitation, reluctance, all of this. Lajaja is the thing that, that vibrates, that does this. Like, it, 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 there is no balance, there is no stability, no serenity, no, no harmony, no complete acceptance. You continue to be uncomfortable about it. You continue to be uncomfortable about it. So, the, you know, the pleasure of, of illicit sex, for instance. The, the person who does this, there are actually scientific data on the emotional consequences of illicit sex. The, the, the person who does this is not in harmony with, you know, with the universal decrees of Allah. He would continue to have this reluctance, this conflict within himself. So sharr is lajaja, or sharr brings about inner conflict. And al khayr is aada. Shara be, al khayr becomes a habit. For the believer, khayr becomes a habit, so you do it naturally. You do it naturally. You, you act kindly towards your kin naturally, without thinking about it. As long as this was instigated for the sake of Allah, and is being maintained for the sake of Allah. And you have the litmus paper tests. Litmus paper tests. Which one is the litmus paper test? If it goes against your interest, you still do it for the sake of Allah. That means that it is for the sake of Allah. So for, for joining the kin, for instance, you act kindly towards your kin. Naturally, you don't think about it. But when are you being tested? When do you get the test? If your kin shuns you, if your relative shuns you, and you join them, that is because you're doing it for Allah. So a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said to him, إِنَّ لِي قَرَابَةً أَصِرُهُمْ وَيَفْطَعُونَنِي وَأُحْسِنُ إِلَيْهِمْ وَيُسِيبُونَ إِلَيْهِ قال إِنْ كَانَ كَمَا تَقُولْ فَكَأَنَّمَا تُسِفُّهُمُ الْمَنْ وَلَا يَزَالْ مَعَكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِمْ ظَهِيرٍ مَا دُمْتَ عَلَى ذَلِ So the man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said to him, I have relatives, I join their kinship and they boycott me and I do good for, uh, to, to them, and they do evil to me. Uh, and the Prophet said to him, if that is true, if that is really true, you are making them ingest the uh, Ramadan, uh, basically the, 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 the fire ashes of Jahannam. And you will continue to have support from Allah against them as long as you keep doing that. So keep doing it. It's a test. You're doing it for Allah or you're doing it because it is just second nature. Because second nature, second nature is to, to be nice to your kin as long as they're nice to you. But you get every time, every once in a while, you get tested. Are you doing this really for Allah or not? Now, they will not be nice to you. What are you going to do? If you continue to be nice to them, then all of this niceness from before was truly for Allah. Carry on. But if you fail in that test, then all of that, you know, was not pretty for Allah. It is just like human nature, human inclination. Having said that, it is important, and the righteous predecessors used to do this. And I don't recall the name of the, the, the one of the Salaf who said that, who, who one time they asked him, there is a funeral, let's go to it. And he said to him, hey, wait a second, let me uh, make an intention. Let me make an intention. So he, he, he basically, he did not want to be, to, to act hastily. You know, there is a funeral there. Let's go. So he goes with the crowd, because everybody else is going. 
No, he, he just wanted one moment of, he wanted to pause and to renew his intention or to affirm his good intention or to make an intention. Because sometimes, like, you know, people ask you to do something and then you say, yes, let's go, let's do this group of people together. So it would be important every once in a while that you really confirm your intention and that you're doing this for, for the sake of Allah. And every once in a while, use your litmus paper test. Use your litmus paper test. If it goes against your interest, if you don't have helpers, are you going to still be doing it? If there is not a large group that is going, are you going to go by yourself to the funeral? If no one else that you know is going, are you, go, are you going to go by yourself or not? There is a funeral of someone. And you have like a couple of brothers who are going. And they tell you, oh, let's go. And then you go. And then another day, there is a funeral. Someone liked the first one. You know, another acquaintance, another person, member of the community. But there is not those two brothers that, that were gone the last, the last time. Are you going to go by yourself or not? If it's truly for Allah, you'll still go. And if you, if, if you don't, then you want to go back and ask yourself, am I doing it just for like to be with the group or doing it for the sake of Allah? So every once in a while, you'll go back. But, but, but it, the, the, the quick answer to this, no, you still get rewarded even if you do not instigate a new intention for every act because the higher for you has become a second nature for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.